Thank you and welcome to City Council Legislative Session. We will start with the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we are on the unceded land of the Spokane people and that these lands were once the major trading center for the Spokanes as they shared this place and welcomed other area tribes through their relations, history, trade, and ceremony. We also want to acknowledge that the land holds the spirit of the place through its knowledge, culture, and all the original people since time immemorial. As we take a moment to consider the impacts of colonization, may we also acknowledge the strengths and resiliency of the Spokane's and their relatives as we work together making decisions that benefit all. May we do so as one heart, one mind, and one spirit. We are grateful to be on the shared lands of the Spokane people and ask for the support of their ancestors and all relations. We ask that you recognize these injustices that forever change the lives of the Spokane people and all their relatives. We agree to work together to stop all acts of continued injustices toward the Native Americans and all our relatives. It is time for reconciliation. We must act upon the truths and take action that will create restorative justice for all. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Fister, please call the roll. Council President Wilkerson. Present. Council Member Sapone. Here. Council Member Cathcart. Present. Council Member Bingle. Here. Council Member Dillon. Here. Council Member Klitsky. Present. Council Member Navarrete. Here. Let the record reflect that all council members are present. Thank you. Two things I want to say. To maintain decorum, there are no demonstrations, banners, signs, applause, profanity, vulgar language, or personal insults. For open forum, you will have two minutes to address and should direct all your comments to me. Since we have more than 20 people signed up for open forum, I'm going to have Mr. Bird go over the process of how we select people. Thank you, Council President. Yeah, I have the spreadsheet pulled up with all those who signed up for open forum. There are 26 total signups. There's some people, if I scroll down on this list. Um, I'll just take the random uh, randomization formula in Excel and pull it down so that everybody is assigned a random number. Copy and paste them as just their values. And then organize those smallest to largest. And that gets us our order, our randomization order. For the first 20, Dennis Flynn, Sam Lee, uh, Dennis Flynn, Sam Lee, Dan Bois, Trev, Travis Ray, Kadeen Rahman, Warbear, uh, Mickey Pike Hatfield, Mike Gleason, Dave Billsland, Earl Moore, Eugene Knowles, Zach McGuckin, uh, Raul Pena, Sunshine Wigan, Tavita, Janelle, Tanya Comstock, um, Travis, Catherine Johnson, and Scott Ward are the first 20 with um, Justice for All and Lucas following that if we have additional people. Um, Will, Char Charles, Anton, and Derek, you're outside of that top 20, so just FYI. Oh, we may have had one person sign up twice. Usually I try to catch those. So Justice will be the last in the top 20. Great, thank you. Uh, 20, 20. 20. That's it? Yeah. Yes. Uh, just uh, FYI, as a reminder for your calendars, on March 18th, we will be at the Northeast Community Center 
for our first town hall since COVID. So please be sure and join us there. Ms. Fisher, if you would start with the consent agenda, please. Would you like to consider oh, appointments first? Please, thank okay. you. <clears throat> Appointment of John Erickson to the Lodging Tax Advisory Committee for a term of March 4, 2024 to March 4, 2025. Appointment of Cami Aguia Aguiyo to the Lodging Tax Advisory Committee for a term of March 4, 2024 to March 4, 2025. Appointment of Rose Noble to the Lodging Tax Advisory Committee for a term of March 4, 2024 to March 4, 2025. Appointment of Ginger Ewing to the Lodging Tax Advisory Committee for a term of February 12, 2024 to February 12, 2028. Appointment of Sandra Neperud to the Plan Commission for a term of March 4, 2024 to March 4, 2028. Appointment of Tim Williams to the Plan Commission for a term of March 4, 2024 to March 4, 2028. And appointment of Jesse Bank to the Plan Commission for a term of March 4, 2024 to March 4, 2028. I will entertain a motion for approval of board appointments. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second to approve the board members as read by Ms. Fister. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any no's? Any abstentions? The ayes have it. Thank you. Consent agenda, reports, contracts, and claims. Number one, subaward agreement with Spokane County in conjunction with the fiscal year 2023 Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant from October 1, 2022 through September 30, 2026, $96,667. Number two, contract amendment with Spokane CDL School LLC to provide commercial driver license training services to the city of Spokane, 100, or excuse me, $30,000 plus tax of applicable. Number three, low bid of Corridor Contractors, LLC, Spokane for Ray Street Water Main Project, $1,362,804. An administrative reserve of $136,280.40, which is 10% of the contract price, will be set aside, Lincoln Heights Neighborhood. Number four, low bid of Hamilton Construction Company, Springfield, Oregon, for Washington Stevens Bridge Deck Rehabilitation Project, $2,882,934. An administrative reserve of $288,293.40 which is 10% of the contract price will be set aside, Riverside Neighborhood. Number five, report of the mayor of pending claims and payments of previously approved obligations, including those of Parks and Library through February 23, 2024. Total $10,951,948.49 with Parks and Library claims approved with respect to boards. Boards excluding Parks and Library total $10,785,716.98. Number six, City Council meeting minutes for February 23 and February 29, 2024. Number seven, multiple family housing property tax exemption conditional agreement with Harlan Douglas for the future construction and renovation of approximately 192 units at parcel number 36204.0069, commonly known as 8625 North Nevada Street. This item was deferred from 26, February 26, 2024 agenda. We have two public comments. The first one is Megra Flatman calling in. Go ahead, Megra, you're unmuted. Thank you. Um, I want to speak on consent agenda item number seven. This was deferred, quote, indefinitely um, just last week, February 26th, but it is back on the agenda tonight. And it concerns a multifamily housing property tax exemption conditional agreement with Harlan Douglas. So page 226 of the agenda estimates that the total construction costs for this product project of 192 apartment units is going to be $12 million. And that sounds like a lot of money. It is a lot of money. But I think it's important to look at who this is benefiting. Um, Harlan. Douglas is a company owned by a billionaire family. Uh, $12 million is statistically nothing for them. And I really want us to take a look at who is benefiting from these tax exemptions because these tax exemptions are supposed to be benefiting people who need housing because Spokane desperately needs affordable housing. Who is benefiting? Harlan Douglas, who is now deceased, uh, was worth up to $1 billion at the time of his death. At the very low end, he hoarded hundreds of millions, at least $500 million. He owned property in five different states, including Washington. And in fact, when he died, he owned 224 Spokane County properties, 224 different properties just in Spokane County. 
$12 million, I want to reiterate, is 1.2% of his total estimated wealth. That is nothing. So for folks making minimum wage, if you are taking home $15,000 a year, 1.2% just for that one year salary is $180. So this is the equivalent of a minimum wage worker being able to construct an apartment building with 192 units that they can then lease out for money for only $180. And then you don't need to pay property taxes or give back to the system in any way. Why are taxpayers subsidizing a company owned by billionaires by gifting them property tax exemptions? In order to qualify for this, page 232 says that at least 30% of the units must be rented or sold as, quote, affordable housing units to low and moderate income households. 30% of the units, which means 70% of the units are able to be leased for more money. We should not be subsidizing billionaires. They only have this mind-boggling wealth because they stole it and they don't pay back into the system. This is ridiculous. So this property tax exemption for one of Spokane's wealthiest mogul families is embarrassing and outrageous, and the taxpayers should not have to subsidize them. Thank you. Thank you. Dennis Flynn? Hi, hey, Council, Madam President. Um, Dennis Flynn, I live near St. Charles. Um, again, I want to thank you and the administration for using our tax dollars to provide for the essential common services that encompass the majority of this consent agenda, agenda uh, 11 million in the mayor's report, 3 million for a bridge rehab, and 1 plus million for a water project. So that's my consolation for tonight, now for some desolation. Uh, I'll quickly circle back to this consent agenda, if you just give me a leeway here. This weekend's gospel reading from St. John is the familiar story of Jesus overturning the tables of the money changers. It seems obvious why Jesus did this, right? He sees the corruption of taking advantage of worshipers, but did you know it's a two-sided corruption? You see, religious custom required an animal sacrifice, and it had to be done at the temple. Tra travelers who didn't want to have, bring their own animal were limited to purchasing from the stock available at the temple. So elevated demand combined with authority-limited supply means less availability, and basic economics says you raise prices when there is more demand than there is supply. This already has the stench of corruption, right? At least it was a meaningful service for those who didn't want to have to bring an animal with them on their travels. But I think it's fair to assume those who control who is allowed to sell the animals in this captured market would receive favors from those sellers, right? The other side of the corruption is the money changers. You see, you had to pay the temple tax in the temple currency only. So you had to trade whatever coin you had, probably Roman coins for that currency. And wherever there's a required trade like that, the person making the trade is going to charge a little bit extra for their services, right? So here's how this applies to this consent agenda. Those that control who can sell the product, such as those who decide what type of housing and where, will receive favors from those who are allowed to build, such as campaign contributions, private and public accolades, or even just building the, quote, right type of housing the controllers want. And those of us who are subject to these whims of the controllers but have a basic need for the product need to not only pay for the shelter we need, but also pay the tax required to subsidize the requisite favors, such as building the right type of housing. Calling our, on our communities, non-denominational and religious organizations to meet the local needs would yield, much, would yield much multiples of better outcomes in comparison to corruptly favoring people like Harlan Douglas and the vast swath of others on last week's agenda. But then those in DC, those in Olympia, wouldn't get the favors from Harlan and others, not to mention the sanctimonious view of self-idolatry straddling atop the false pedestal of moral advantage we so often see our politicians claim. I've said it before and I'll say it again. You think you know better, but you're no better than us deciding for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Any council commentary on the consent agenda? Council Member Bingo. Yeah, I appreciate the <clears throat> commentary that came in on that. Um, uh, our, our multifamily tax exemption tool is something that's not in perpetuity. It's, it's for a certain amount of time to help spur some investment. And if you look at the amount of housing units that were built before this multifamily tax exemption came in to play versus now, um, it is clear that this is a useful, useful tool for the community. And 
a hidden tax right now that is not um, being seen is the fact that there is such low demand or such, such high demand and such low supply when it comes to housing that rents are increasing as well. In my view, from a fiscally conservative uh, position, it's actually far better for the community on their pocketbook for us to uh, provide this tool for people like Harlan Douglas, and not just Harlan Douglas. Harlan Douglas and his estate is very wealthy. That's because they have made a lot of good business moves uh, over their time. They didn't steal that wealth. What they've done is they've invested heavily in the city of Spokane, and we all have a significant amount of housing because uh, the Douglas family has provided it. They're not the only ones providing housing. Many people come before us and receive this multifamily tax exemption, and uh, it's on as little as uh, you know four units. I mean, we have the fourplexes that are now being built because of BOCA uh, and the BOH program now that are, that are coming forward, making, helping projects to pencil when you consider that there are other policies that are causing supply chain issues and, and uh, building costs to go up and those kinds of things. We have to find every tool at our disposal for us to help the people in our city, and that's what our focus is. And through this tool, we've actually been able to see a lot of housing built. Is it the perfect system? Absolutely not. Based on what we have right now, this is the best thing available to us to get some housing built for people who desperately need it because they're watching their rents going up six and $700 a month and their Social Security isn't keeping up or whatever it is isn't keeping up. And so I'm proud to support this one. I think that it's really good. I think it's good for the community. I hope more people, not just Harlan, take us up on this option and we get some housing built because we so desperately need it. Thank you. Any other council commentary? I am also in support of this. Last week we had six or seven more multifamily tax exemptions and they weren't all Harlan Douglas. They were smaller developers and the opportunity for smaller developers to come into our market to really make a difference. Uh, that being said, all in favor of the consent agenda, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any no's? Any abstentions? The ayes have it. Ms. Fister. Resolution 2024-0023, adopting various amendments to the City Council's rules or procedure. Public comment. We'll start with Sam Lee and then Travis Ray. My name is Sam Lee. I'm a SCAR volunteer and a PSL member. When city council passed an Islamophobic, racist, ahistorical resolution sympathizing with the apartheid state of Israel, mass mobilizations of city council demanded the rescindment of said resolution. Mass mobilizations occurred for several weeks and city council heard from the people that this resolution was inadequate and harmful and that the liberation of Palestinian people must be centered. City Council retaliated by making unconstitutional and racist rule changes. I'm referring to Rule 2.15G that reserves the first three rows of sitting for staff and official presenters, and there's no rational basis to leave 45 seats empty every week. This week, there's two empty rows, so that's 30, around 30 empty seats every week. This is illegal. Under 2.15G reads that no one should impede pathways, entrances, and exits. This is overbroad language that can be interpreted and applied to the entire chamber. There have been mentions of fire code violations and the ADA to support the restrictions of standing, but this documentation hasn't been provided after multiple asks. Multiple asks. We perceive both provisions as thinly veiled discriminations and racism against BIPOC people in this room. Last Wednesday, Betsy Wilkerson admitted at a meeting that these unconstitutional and racist rule changes were implemented in response to activists. Again, Betsy Wilkerson admitted the unconstitutional rule changes were because of activists, but pinned the blame on us for not wanting to work together to cement rules that violate our First Amendment rights. We are being asked to compromise on unconstitutional rule changes, and we will not compromise our bodily autonomy. Many times, city councils accuse us of being disrespectful. I'm a biracial Asian person coming to you with issues that I care about, and yet, I'm called disrespectful and I am silenced. We are silenced. I cannot count how many times I've heard that word from you all the last several months. And it must be painful to be close to the truth. How does it feel in your body, on your lips, to speak the words disrespect when you deeply know that it is you who is inflicting disrespect onto the people you tell yourself you represent? You know power. And perhaps you all Thank told you. yourself your that you would up. know. Thank you, Sam. Travis Ray? Oh, I'm sorry. 
It's still going. Oh, it's still going. Sam, did you say? I'm sorry, my apologies. Do you Council have President, just a, a point of order. There was some standing going on, and I know some of our rules are kind of on hiatus, but I believe they were obstructing the view of a number of our members here. And we're just asking people to please be respectful of others if you're blocking their view. Sam, I'm sorry, go ahead. And you have 30, 60 more seconds. That was also disrespectful. How does it feel in your body, on your lips, to speak the words disrespect when you deeply know that it is you who is inflicting disrespect onto the people you tell yourself you represent? You know power. And perhaps you all told yourselves that you would know how to wield it responsibly, truthfully, respectfully when you were elected as city council members. The truth is you hold institutional power and institutional power has no regard for the people. To deny this is also a part of the power that you hold. We have the power of the people, and your retaliatory rule changes remind us of our power. Reverse the rule changes that are in violation of our rights and move open forum back to the beginning of meetings. Thank you. Travis Ray? My name is Travis oh, Ray. Sorry, my apologies. That's all right. Um, I'm a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation and a volunteer for SCAR. In a meeting last Wednesday, myself and fellow activists hoped we could discuss further problematic rule books. The further problematic <clears throat> rule book of City Council, beyond the obvious bad, no standing and videotaping rules set in place and work on ways to create a more welcoming space within and outside City Council chambers. The activists in the room were met with denial and avoidance of court issues, the same inequitable issues that brought us to the meeting in the first place. Rule 2.15G states that we must comply with fire code and the ADA. <clears throat> we have asked repeatedly for that fire code and ADA documentation that states we cannot stand in these specific areas. Where is it? Where is the map that shows where we can and cannot stand? 2.15G specifically lists the aisles, entrances, exits, pathways, and reserve seating that makes up the entirety of the city council chambers. For years, and specifically the last few months, activists with the Spokane Community Against Racism and people of color have been seated in these now reserved areas Give me one rational reason why we need 30 reserved seats. This is clearly a racist attempt to deter us. <clears throat> Council President Betsy Wilkerson admitted these problematic rule changes were in response to some of the same activists as we continue to mobilize in large numbers week after week in protest of the pro-Israel resolution under our First Amendment rights. It seems the goal of this meeting was not to hear our voices as all of our questions are still unanswered, but to try and weaken us into compromise by focusing the attention on the language of these unconstitutional rules instead of dropping them altogether and moving on to more important issues. Hopes of working with the city council to affirm rules that did not restrict the people's rights and furthermore create a progressive Spokane were left at the door by an unwilling and unprepared city council. It stands clear that bickering about whether or not people can stand where they can stand and controlling our bodily autonomy in general and creating these thin veils of discrimination is a bigger importance to the city council than actually working together to build up our community. As a reminder, we are working with you. It is city council who is not working with the people. We'll be back. Thank you. Tavita? Is he online? I don't see him in the room. Yeah, Tavita, I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Tavita, you're unmuted. We can come back, maybe. Uh, yes, we'll come back to you, Tavita. Next, we're going to have Union Carter and then Scott Ward. Uh, 
Okay. Um, good evening, City Council. I'm here to talk about the standing rule in all the amendments with open forum and different council rules. Um, first, I'm really thankful for all the people who come out. I don't come to City Council every single week, but I know that there are plenty of people behind me that come to City Council every single week, and I'm here to speak for them and for the people like me who may come um, every once in a while and who want the ability to stand and not be policed where to stand or who to stand in front of. Um, and I understand the new language with the fire code and the ADA compliance, and I'm not here to argue about that. I think that those things are important, and I'm not going to question the legality of those, but I really hope that those things aren't being used as blankets to say the aisle ways or other things aren't being or can't be used um, for those reasons. Um, and I understand that. Um, sorry, my notes are all over the place. Um, I understand that a lot of this questioning around standing came from a particular group like the SCAR and PSL folks that come down pretty regularly. Um, and as a lot of them said, like we feel like it's racist because a lot of this group is people of color, it's young people. Um, and these are like youth votes that got you all into office that you all claim that you really care about when you run for office, but when they come out to speak, um, it's something that's policed, it's something that we feel like we can't come and talk. Um, and I'm thankful to have a job that supports that, but I wouldn't know what to do if I felt like I was being policed by city council um, and it didn't feel like it was a safe place for me to come and even stand. Um, I question the reason why there are so many reserved spots. I understand that there's city staff that come. I don't know if there's 40 people that come every single Monday. I've never seen 40 people in the times that I've came. Um, but I really hope that you consider um, bringing back standing with really limited um, rules around where people can stand. I think that it's not the distraction that it may be um, imaged to be. I think that um, people want to come and have their voice heard, have them feel like they can participate in a government process. Um, for many people, this is the only government process that they get a response to or they get to um, engage in and feel like it's meaningful rather than like, sending emails to reps and they never respond or you get some sort of automated message to get to look to you in your face or even if I turn my back to your face, you know how I feel about stuff and that's really important for this process. Um, I just want to echo the other things that were said. I missed a couple of the other testimonies, but I believe that people should be able to stand with really limited regulations. Um, yeah, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Scott. You're unmuted. Thank you. Yeah, I'm here to demand that every week we host open forum at the beginning of the meeting with 20 randomized slots, allow standing, recording, and presentations unrestricted. Uh, do not restrict the topics that people can speak on at open forum, including global issues and ballot measures. Uh, open forum should be uh, the people's hour. It should be the time for the people to bring their wants and their needs uh, and their issues to you, and you should be intently listening to them. It should not be placed at the back of the meeting as if it's not a priority. It should be the first priority because it's the only place where we, the people, get to der drive the conversation, drive the policy discussion, drive what's being brought to the table. That's the only spot where it is our choice what is being discussed, and that should be prioritized first. Um, I, I also want to talk on the uh, discriminatory way that the rules have been enforced. Uh, even tonight, you just saw, uh, I can't remember, Cathcart or Bingle, one of them already trying to do point of order is about standing. Um, the rules are not applied to other groups. They're just not. Last week, uh, conservative right-wing people, older white men, were audibly booing and making outbursts out loud. Not a single council member point of ordered them. Not council president, not Bingle who acts like he's, he, you know, he disagrees with these rules, that he's for everybody's freedom of speech and everybody should get to go up there and yell at him. I mean, he literally told me that he thinks that, but he's just got to enforce the rules. Well, he doesn't, he doesn't enforce it on his buddies. He doesn't enforce it on his fellow right wing Christian nationalists that, that come. So, you know, there's only certain people who get point of ordered, and it's one, or, it's, it's, it's one group of people. 
So let's not act like, you know, we're just about the rules and trying to be fair here. Um, the whole essentially unprecedented mobilizations at city council for the last year, especially the last few months, and so how do you suppress that? How do you make it so it's more comfortable for y'all up there who are looking at your phones half the time when people are testifying, especially Zappones. Zappones never make an eye contact with anybody when they're speaking practically. Um, and so, you know, how do you make it more comfortable? Oh, let's move open form to the back so less people will show up. Let's, let's ban standing so people don't feel like they can, they can participate unless they're gonna give a speech. So, you know, it's very obvious. If you guys are actually for the people, I don't believe you are. I've never thought that. You know, you're gonna have to prove me wrong. Show me that you're actually for the people, that you actually care and want people to participate in this government process, or do you just want people to not Thank show you, up Scott. to, to, to not participate? Up. Thank you. Council President. Yes. If there's some time code they could refer to when those boos were at a previous meeting, I, I don't think I heard them at the time, so. Thank you, Councilman. Justice and then Megra. Hello, my name is Justice for All, uh, Spokane, a city of Spokane resident. Um, I just want to say that these council members have been laughing during people's testimony. Very appropriate, right? Um, for the last four months ago, I've been warning council that these rule changes were a bad idea, that they were going to be a headache, and they have been a headache, not only for you, but definitely for me, because apparently y'all have made it my problem. Um, and since you've made it my problem, I, I, I will once again reiterate the solution. Please drop these bad rules. No one cares. Really, no one cares. It's, it was a peaceful protest. It was doing absolutely nothing. It, it wasn't stopping anyone from speaking up here, and it wasn't stopping y'all from speaking up there. I don't understand why we continue to go over rules that are just literally un 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 unconstitutional. And if you think they're constitutional, why are they suspended every week? The reason why, uh, to make it as clear as possible, is because they're unconstitutional. And the reason why we continue to have these discussions is because, unfortunately, yes, a mistake was made, and it needs to be corrected. And it needs to be clear, because that's how rules are. You can't just have really broad, arbitrary rules because that doesn't make sense to people. There are people who are neurodivergent who need very clear rules, and there are also you need to have reasoning for what you do and why you do it. That is called being a responsible council person. If you say there's reasons for the fire code, what section of the fire code? I happen to have read the entire fire code. And I would love to know specifically what section says a person is now an ob ob obstructing people from exiting a building that is on fire because that is not part of fire code, because we, have a re we think reasonably for people. We expect people, in a case of an emergency, to work with one another. And in case somebody's disabled, to work with that person. And in case somebody's telling you for the last four months that you're making a mistake, to maybe try and listen and understand that person, not vilify that person. I make that person's life harder, not contact their bosses. You know, just act like a reasonable person and just listen. Be fair to yourselves and each other. Thank you. Thank you. Megra and then Ashley. Go ahead, Megra. Um, so... On page 280 of the council agenda, it lists the summary background for these new rule changes. It says, since the rules were changed on January 22nd, council, quote, has since identified both technical and substantive concerns with those rules and received considerable comment on the public participation element. So that sounds good, right, that we're changing because of those reasons. 
there has been two different legal letters sent to council. One was from Spokane Community Against Racism on January 29th, and one was from the ACLU February 9th. Both of these letters spoke of the illegality of restricting the constitutionally protected right of standing, as well as the illegality of restricting the Washington Open Public Meetings Act protected right of filming meetings. Um, there was also an incredible amount of public testimony protesting the time change, moving open form to the end of the night, and opposing the removal of visual and media presentations, which are incredibly helpful. I, somebody last year was talking about how um, a chart is worth a thousand years, and since he only gets two minutes to speak, he's going to bring presentations every week. That was incredibly visually helpful. So there was a ton of people who very specifically spoke ardently against restricting standing because especially for Spokane's BIPOC community members, standing is one of the only safe forms of expression they have because the hateful inflammatory rhetoric that comes from this dais doesn't end in council chambers. It permeates through the community and they've received violent threats, physical threats, mental threats, yelling, emotional abuse. Standing is the only way they feel safe to express themselves to their elected officials to try to get this abuse to stop. This summary sounds like these new rules are addressing any of these changes above, but it is not. Standing is still restricted, and we just heard a council member speak about people standing. Page 349, Rule 2.15G. Visual presentations are still banned, page 338, Rule 2.2E. Filming is still restricted, page 351, Rule 2.15M. These rules restrict public participation. They still restrict freedom of expression, speech content, topics of conversation, and civil liberties. These are still overly broad, ill-defined, and subject to extreme discretion. We have seen videos recorded of white women standing and not being point of ordered, but as soon as a BIPOC person stands, there's immediate swarming. This isn't right. These rules should not be discretionarily applied. There's also a rule in here um, rule 2.15N on page 351, and it says that it limits speech. It says, in the name of electioneering, that. Thank you, Megra. Your time is up. There's, thank thank you. you. Ashley and then Dennis. Go ahead, Ashley. You're unmuted. Ashley, we're having a hard time hearing you in chambers. Hold on one second. Could you please hit star three? Go ahead and try again, Ashley. Does that sound better? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, thank you. Yep. Normally, when I come to meetings, I start by greeting city council. I introduce myself, but I'm not sure what the point of or worth there is in addressing city council members themselves anymore. Let's all start why others and myself are speaking on Resolution 23. This is yet another of many failures by this council to show any desire to represent the working class people they claim to. This city council has a clear pattern of silencing public engagement that is not quiet obedience. So let's get the facts straight. In response to increased public engagement, we have seen many changes in the last five to six months. First, city council reinterpreted rules to strip any ability for citizens to mention specific counselors, not just address them directly, not to mention them at all. Of course, only enforced when they don't like what's being said a rule they attempted to silence a very prominent BIPOC member of the Spokane community. And instead of showing humility in the face of the reality that they will not be silenced, the city council literally ran from their podiums. They then banned clapping, yet again, only enforce that rule when they don't like what's being said. Both of these rules were already obvious and shameful reactions to public interaction in these chambers. 
This council didn't stop there, though, proceeding to ban standing and recording. What possible reason is your city council have for banning standing? An unobtrusive act of acknowledgement as you could make. They can't make up their mind. Wilkerson has openly stated these rules were made to target the activists. They have also said standing was threatening, and now it violates the fire code. These are not people you can trust to represent you. Instead of listening to the passionate and important views and perspectives of our BIPOC community members, who every Monday are often sitting in the seats you have now reserved, you, instead of getting to the business of taking care of this city, this council wastes their time and hours comically failing to represent any of us. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis, and then Dave. Hey, Council, Dennis Flynn, I live near St. Charles. Regarding the council rules, there's, I agree with some of this, right? It's, it's, it's not appropriate to hide behind an ADA proclaimed re announcement. It's just the rules are the rules, right? And, and the failure has been that they haven't been enforced by this president, Kinnear, the previous president, or the previous president before that. Um, and some people, including me, have been complaining about this for, what, a year now? Um, so it's not all, uh, I'm sure, what is being said. Why can't I hold up a sign when in these chambers, whether at this dais or in the gallery? Why are those in the gallery admonished when they groan or make a verbal comment during someone else speaking at the dais? If I held up one hand with all but one finger folded down, but no words came out of my mouth, would I be relaying a message to you, otherwise known as speech? We have decorum or behavior in keeping with good taste and propriety, specifically conforming to standards to allow all to have an equal opportunity to participate on fair ground. Does fair mean easy? No. It is difficult to get up here. I've done it a lot, and every time my blood pressure skyrockets, my heart rate goes up, and I get nervous as heck. But the convention, the decorum, is for me to come down to this dais. Likewise, anyone who wants to use their speech must also come to this dais. Now, like my hand gesture example, the standing that is occurring is purposely meant to convey a message, is it not? It's a message of either approval or disapproval, but it's obviously a message which we all agree is using a form of speech. Allowing someone to groan or make a verbal comment from the, from the gallery or to stand is allowing someone to use speech. And I don't agree with people who lean more on my side who are a bit started doing this last week. And the decorum of these proceedings allows for only the person at the dais to use speech, and even then only in the spoken word possibly accompanied by a digital presentation if that changes back in the future. So let's be honest and full of clarity on opportunity to use speech. This meeting is not the only opportunity to use speech in our civic engagement with our governing bodies. We may write you letters, we may send you emails, we may call you, we may meet with you in person. There is ample opportunity to engage with you if someone doesn't have the maturity and fortitude to come down to this dais to use verbal speech. I've written to you about this multiple times over the course of months, maybe a year, if you continue to allow people not at the dais to use their speech, then I suggest you may be inspiring other speech, as we've noticed starting last week, outside of decorum that you would rather didn't occur. Thank you. Thank you. Dave? Is Dave online? Dave? Since the problem here is you don't like people to stand, let's just pretend for a moment I take a knee because I can't reach the microphone that way. Now, isn't that silly? Yeah, it is. And that's the point I'm making, telling us whether or not we can stand or sit. Is this kindergarten? It sure ain't church. Congregation rise, congregation sit, congregation kneel. No. This is government. And I say this, government, get your hands off my body. Don't you tell me when to sit and stand. That's my business, not yours. This ain't kindergarten. Thank you, Dave. Zach? Zach McGuckett. 
and then Kadeem, and then after that, if we can go back and see if we can get Tavita on the line. Um, hello, my name is Zachary McGuckin. I'm a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation and a Spokane resident. Um, since uh, in a recent meeting with members of PSL and SCAR and PJALS, uh, Council Mem uh, President Wilkerson uh, stated that at least some of these rules um, were to uh, deal with activists, to deal with these mobilizations. Um, I want to argue that these false claims of, you know, oh, it's for intimidation, oh, it's for... Uh, it's blocking people's views that these arguments have been uh, BS the whole time. And you can see that because every single rule that is being passed is to attempt to uh, attack specific uh, things that our mobilizations were doing. Standing helped us because uh, if tr uh, more than 20 people in this allotted time slot uh, show up, if only 20 people can speak, then it doesn't matter what uh, the other 30, 45 people have to say. But if they can stand and show their support, then it matters. Standing is speech. I don't think anyone's denying that, but it's a speech that's protected by our First Amendment rights. And that is why both SCAR and the ACLU has told you that these rules are unconstitutional and illegal. So why are we spending so much time talking about these, these unconstitutional, illegal rules? Uh, a month ago or so, Range Media published an article where they said the specific percentage of the amount of time council has spent on meeting rules this year. Don't we have better things to be talking about? The police have been on a rampage murdering people and you're more concerned with silencing people in this chamber than you are with stopping the slaughter our police force is engaged in. You're more concerned with silencing people in this chamber than condemning a genocide that's currently occurring and calling for peace. You're more concerned with silencing people in this chamber than you are with addressing uh, the housing issues, the fentanyl crisis, um, for doing anything to benefit the poor and oppressed people of Spokane. You're more concerned with silencing people in this chamber than addressing any of the issues, any of the dilemmas that our society is currently facing. And so why are we having this discussion still? Why aren't we talking about the issues, the dilemmas that our impact our society and people care about. Why are you so determined to silence us? It's because when we're here, you can't just pass your uh, seven O votes on laws that are oppressing you, us, and you need up. to be held accountable. Thank you. Kadin. Hello, City Council. My name is Kadeen Rahman, and I'm a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation. A lot of people have stood up here talking about how these rules are unconstitutional, plain stupid, they're racist, and while I 100% agree with all those, I want to talk a little bit more about the power behind all of this. You have young BIPOC people come in here every week wanting nothing more than to just represent their community and have their voices heard. They do this through nonviolent actions, standing, turning their backs. Hey, point of order, I'm really sorry. What's this gentleman doing? Make sure you pay attention so Bingo doesn't keep chewing on his finger. See y'all. I'm really sorry about that. Yeah. There's You're some good. disruptive behavior behind you. So, Please continue. Yeah. Many of these activists participated through nonviolent means standing, turning their backs, simply expressing their opinion. Yet we have these members of council sitting up here in a position of state elected power, using the threat of violence, specifically bringing police in whenever things don't go your way or whenever you're too afraid to be called out by name. We have people like Zapone, hardly paying attention to any testimonies, Cathcart being on his phone. Bingle, I know that you love to laugh during people's testimonies as well. That's something you really enjoy. But 
throughout all of this, you guys hold the power. We don't. And that's really what the issue is here. You prevent us any possible way uh, to form any sort of political expression outside of those who can speak on this mic. You know, like Justice said, there's a lot of people who have disabilities, who are neurodivergent, who maybe struggle with public speaking, who still deserve to have their voice heard, but they can't participate because this council refuses to let them. You remove the seats where these activists sit at, trying to push them further and back because it's always about this idea of intimidation. Intimidation which just goes back to the fact that you are afraid of people of color speaking their minds on this white supremacist capitalist state. That's all that it is. So I'm demanding that we bring back open forum to the beginning with 20 randomized spots, that we have no restrictions on standing, presentations, or anything of the sort. And I just hope that you all remember that when people have all the nonviolent options stripped away with them, they're left with one thing. And that's all I have. Thank you. Hello. Um, I had to figure out a way to uh, do some stuff in my computer to get this mic on. Well, Tavita, uh, we can hear you. We can't see you, but we can hear you. Okay, yeah. Um, my name is Tavita Fakasieki. Um, many of you know me. Uh, I'm very disappointed and frustrated at this the repetition of trying to take away our rights through speech, mouth, through oral, through body, through standing, all of it. I'm, I'm incapable of describing to you my frustration. Many of those who have spoken before me have already said what I said, and it's just frustrating that we keep continuing to like repeat, repeat, and not doing anything about it. I suggest we move our open forum to the beginning, as Kadeen has said, and, and doing the 20 people, doing the 20 people, um, that's about it. I'm just frustrated. Thank you. We got everybody. Okay. All right. We have everybody. Any council commentary? Council member Bingo. Yeah, I just, I, I think that these council rules are, are fixing a lot of the issues that we found to be true from the statements that you have made um, and through you know, addressing it with our with our legal counsel. Um, I'm, I'm confused at some of the testimony tonight because this is specifically trying to address those those, those two specific issues um, on standing and recording and uh, making sure that we are within the bounds of the law. And so um, I, I would say that we are, we are doing exactly what you're telling us that we're not doing, but I think we are doing it, so. Thank you. Anything else, commentary? Yeah, I got uh, some things I'd like to say. Um, I really don't care whether you sit or stand. <laughs> I really don't. Um, we're changing the rules back to reflect some of the letters that we got um, to say that, you know, we're more concerned with silencing you all than fentanyl or housing crisis um, just is simply not true. Um, you know, I tried to keep open form at the beginning. I brought forth an amendment. Uh, it was voted down. And, um, you know, I, I can't go back and, and change time. Um, especially with what happened in November. A lot of this um, is still lingering um, from that night in November, um, and we're still dealing with that, and I'm really sorry um, that it's taken so long and that we're here at this point. I agree with you that, you know, we all have <laughs> different things that we like to be um, um, working on, and I think as we just saw, um, you know, the gentleman that, that came down the, the aisle um, will do a better job, I think, of trying to 
call balls and strikes when we see them. I mean, that is kind of our role up here, too, when we do see um, disruptive behavior or uh, the rules being uh, applied in a way that could be discriminatory. discriminatory. Um, I do want to speak a little bit to some other feedback um, that I got around, you know, global issues and, and ballot measures. And we all know that global issues have an impact here uh, locally. Um, you know, what happens uh, globally impacts us locally. And I think we do, do believe that. Um, but specific to ballot measures, I think that there's some confusion. Um, it's basically to prevent, uh, like, electioneering. So... You know, for example, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you know, Chris, but uh, we had a couple council res resolutions on some ballot measures, like our libraries. And so um, those are fine to come down and, and speak to because that's on the legislative agenda. Um, you're speaking to the contents of the resolution. But what we can't have um, is council members or members of the public telling people how to vote uh, for or against uh, a ballot measure um, that's coming up for a vote. So there's just some kind of nu nuances there and happy to talk about that uh, more because I understand how that is that can be confusing. Um, again, it's not as much of an attempt to silence you as it is um, our state election laws and what we can do in a public building uh, when talking about uh, a ballot measure. Um, but I totally understand how that can be confusing. Um, I'm hopeful that um, you know we can get to a better place on these take the temperature down a bit um, and be um, responsive to your concerns. So, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'll just briefly say that um, I, I think the genesis of this rule started way before anything in October, and I think that's often forgotten. Um, it started by us trying to focus, it, it started in conversations over the summer in a work group and had nothing to do with this uh, or recent events. Um, but really, it was about trying to create a place where people feel welcome to speak and be heard here. And uh, I think part of listening and having a conversation is that it goes both ways. And I think it's unfortunate that we've tried to communicate to uh, other people that individuals don't feel safe, sorry, they don't feel comfortable in that they, when they come and speak here, and that we're trying to create a space for them. And that has not been heard. There has been nothing that's being responded to about that. And it's been communicated over and over, whether that's here publicly or in conversations trying to come up to rules. There is a group that is trying to take over that space. And we were trying to create a space for everyone. And whether you believe us or not, we get emails all the time asking us to create a space where everyone feels welcome and that they can come and speak. And so. It's um, frustrating for everyone, but we have to have rules that we think creates that space for everyone. Um, and so uh, I think that's an important part. This is one of many rules in this package, and I think that um, you know, we're all trying to do the best that we can, and we'll continue to dialogue and have conversation. Councilmember Kliske. Well, thanks, everybody, for your commentary today and continuing to come down. Um, as many of you probably know, I wasn't on council when most of these controversial things happened. Um, however, um, coming down and testifying, although it's, it's a good, gratifying way to come down and um, interact with your representatives, it's not the only way to interact with your representatives. And we have to give equal standing to everyone in every way that they contact us. And we hear just as much feedback about not wanting standing, not wanting an open forum at the beginning, and not wanting us to weigh, out, weigh in on international issues, frankly. Um, so please do be aware that there are other ways. Um, I also don't have a particular issue with folks making a demonstration, but I do have an issue with folks blocking other folks. And when there is attempts to intimidate, which does sometimes happen in this room, it's not exclusive to one group. And it is definitely not like aimed at any group, but when we see it happen, it's always a chilling effect. And it is hard to get 
other groups to come down and to testify at open forum if they're not used to it. So um, in the spirit of compromise, which I've heard some people say is a bad thing, we are making changes to these rules. Legislation isn't always straightforward and perfect the, same, the first time. This is a difficult process because this is democracy, and democracy is difficult. But um, as, even though I agree that international issues do affect us, we get just as many comments criticizing us for talking about them, and we also get diminishing returns for how effective we are at influencing international issues. So there is some validity to some of that criticism. And when we are criticized for talking about those issues and arguing about open forum and saying that, and when folks say that we're not focusing on our issues of the city and wasting time on this, I think it's interesting that those are the same people telling us to have an open forum at the beginning when we're trying to conduct our council business and issues of the city, issues that are on the agenda at the beginning. So like I said, like it's not a compromise unless nobody's happy. That's what my dad always said, and it's kind of turning out to be true here. So thank you. Council President, mm -hmm. this behavior does appear to be disruptive. In our council rules, they have the ability that we will be voting on, and the rules were suspended for them to stand and to turn as long as it's not disruptive and blocking anybody's view. Uh, yeah. Any other? I, I might say that they're blocking view right, right now. Yeah. No. Thank you. Any other council commentary? Council Member Navarrete. Um, I'm going to piggyback what Council Member Klitsky said about not being here when the rules were, when the stand up uh, rules were adopted. But I'm also in agreement with Council Member Dillon on wanting to, you know, if you want to stand up uh, or sit down, you know, do whatever you want. I was in that, I was in those seats. Um, once upon a time, I was there protesting. I was also standing up and giving my back uh, to council um, when I when I was when I was there. Um, <laughs> we just we need to work together, and by meeting all of you and talking about changing these rules is because we want to make you comfortable, but not. We don't only represent a group, we represent a whole other, con just different constituents. The reason for me as a person of color to run or to apply for city council was for representation because I also felt um, that I was not being heard. And I also hated being in that um, podium speaking uh, in front of city council because I understand um, Mr. Flynn, your blood pressure goes up, and I've seen people shaking uh, when you give your testimony. We want to change that. Um, we want to work with you, and I mean, I personally am ready to move move on and uh, make uh, you know sign resolutions, work for the community for the best. But it's going to take both sides to do it. Thank you. I will say we've had many comments about our council rules, which is, is now the 1st of March, which they should have been adopted in January. But because we were listening and we wanted our community to be a part of that, and thank you all for bringing things to our attention that our legal department did not bring to our attention when we first started these rules. And I was a little testy about that. But here we are. But I want to make clear right now, if you read the rules, the right to stand is expressly recognized. We spent a lot of narrative and conversation about that tonight. In the rules, it is your right to stand. It is your right uh, to turn your backs, if that's your form of expression. As we go forward as a council and as council president, I cannot always see everything 
that's happening in this room because a lot of my attention is directly on the speaker, which I think they deserve to have my undivided attention. So other council members do call out things that I don't see. And we will continue to work hard to apply the rules equally in this chamber as we go forward. I agree, if nobody's happy, then we may almost be right there in the middle to accomplish other things in our city government. But I want to thank you all for showing up and expressing yourselves. I don't have any issue with that. Thank you, council members, for staying in this. There have been so many amendments, I have lost track of trying to get to a place where we can actually make this work for as many people as we can. If there's no other council commentary, I'm ready to take the vote. Thank you. Ms. Sister? Resolution 2024-0024, updating the appointments of city council members to boards, committees, and commissions for 2024. There is no public comment on that. Any council commentary? Council Member Bingo. Yeah, I know that we're just reapportioning um, to um, accommodate our, our newest uh, Council Member Navarrete, uh, and I'm glad that she'll be getting some boards and commissions. I obviously still have one massive problem here that we could have fixed. District 1 still not represented on STA. Highest ridership, highest poverty rates in the city. We should be represented on STA. We continue to not be represented on STA. We continue to be told that uh, county commissioners can represent our districts and other things like that. And uh, as I hear groups talking about representation and how important it is uh, for everybody to be represented, I don't see anybody up in arms about STA uh, and District 1 not being represented there, which I think is, is actually a big deal. Uh, and it's important that, uh, that our people in our district have uh, the representation, uh, especially when we have four council members. We have four council members on STA. And uh, that seems pretty logical that we could have one from every council district and the council president on that, uh, on that board and everybody be well represented. But that is not the case. And uh, until that time comes, I will vote against our boards and commissions because it is not right that District 1 is not represented on STA. Prepare to vote. Thank you. Ms. Fister. Resolution 2024-25, approving settlement of Marianne Butto, $100,000. <coughs> There's no council commentary on this. This was a slip and fall accident. Prepare to vote. Thank you. Resolution 2024-26, declaring the Inovia Foundation a sole source for the providing of programming, coordination, and organization for the 50th anniversary celebration of the 1974 World's Fair in Spokane and authorizing a contract with the organization. Any council commentary? Councilmember Bingo. Yeah, I'm really excited about this. Expo uh, 50 is, is coming up closer and closer. Uh, May 4th is the opening weekend. Um, as the uh, liaison to the park board, we've been talking about this for years. I've only been here for a couple of years. We've been talking about it almost my entire time here. I'm excited that it's finally here. I hope that uh, the city of Spokane has nine weeks of terrific celebration, celebrating the, uh, the history of Expo, that we all have a good time coming together, enjoying our city, enjoying the beautiful river that we have flowing through here, enjoying our beautiful riverfront park, enjoying a lot of the, the, uh, um, the natural assets that we have in this city. I think it's going to be a great time for our city, and I hope it, uh, I hope it, uh, I hope it goes really well. Councilmember Dillon. Has there been any thought to a Star Wars tie-in with May the 4th? I, listen, with you? I've been kicking it around. Nobody's listening to me. I will say that I may be the only council member who was here around in 1974 and actually worked Expo 74, so do the math on that. Um, 
we are declaring Inovia as a sole source because of the donations that are coming through uh, to support this. They are the entity that will be able to help us. I, too, am excited about Expo 50 mm -hmm. uh, going forward as a celebration for our city yeah. and all the good work in the environment. So I look forward to that. Um, powwow's coming back. It's going to be a big deal. And we have invited as many dignitaries as we can. So we hope they will all show up. Prepare to vote. Thank you. Ordinance C-3645 relating to the regulation of special events and establishing a process allowing for expanded events amending sections 10.39.030, .030, .040, and .05 of the Spokane Municipal Code. We have several uh, comments on that. Uh, first we have Derek Azaro and then Will Hewlings. Derek? Derek Azaro, District 1. Okay. Be before I talk, I'd like to say something real quick. I don't appreciate being told that I'm, uh, you know, it referred to as Bingle and Cathcart's one of his buddies, as what was just said. The fact of the matter is, I spend all week, every week, working on the issue of kids can't walk in to our schools safely, sidewalks, uh, big ticket items that affect our neighborhood and our community. I'm not here to you know, play favors. The reason I talk to these two men, they are my district representatives. I have no reason to be talking to anybody else here except for maybe the president. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I don't care what the opinion is back here, turn your back on me, whatever you want. It doesn't matter to me. Because I'm here actually with city business that affects the children in our city. That's what I'm here for. That's what I'm fighting for. And that leading up to that, you can start. This ordinance, the alcohol ordinance, I read through it. I didn't print it out, unfortunately, but it's been amended. It's basically a twisting of words. It's the same thing it was in the beginning. It's no longer a you know, beer garden. Now it's called something else. Uh, they said no barriers uh, now, but you can't leave the area with alcohol. You can't bring alcohol in. There's no barriers that are there. They want to have more, uh, I forgot what he called it, uh, spirit serving stations or whatever it's being called now. This is the same thing in the beginning. This, you should just tear this up and throw it away. You've had how many deferrals on it? You shouldn't even brought this forward in the first place. You should have had it all worked out. You should have all the players involved, go through all the arguments, discuss it all, then bring it to the council, and like they say, wasting time. That is a waste. This whole thing is a waste of time. It wasn't professionally handled. It was handled immaturely. You should have had all the players before either one of these two, Dylan and Zapone, brought this forward. They should have sat down and had the, everybody involved, work it all out, like I just said, bring it forward, let us hear what the facts are on it, and then instead of debating it here week after week after week after week, defer after defer after defer, you know, it's just, it's ridiculous, totally ridiculous, because you want no bandings, no this, you know, one wants to bands. As far as I know, all the years I went to events, anywhere I came, we lived, there was a structured program involved. I can tell you right now, the person who's going to take the brunt of this and the end of it all is going to be that person serving the alcohol. They're going to be the end all that's going to end up getting in trouble. Not anybody else, because that's the person that's serving the liquor to the public. As far as having children around, I am blown away that an employee of the school district, a high school teacher, is on, has anything to do with this, with this. It's like so controversy, so much controversy behind it. Thank you, Darren. Thank you. Will? Good evening, my name is Will Hewlings and I live downtown Spokane. It's probably gonna sound like a broken record, but I kinda read this before, but as a very concerned adult citizen of Spok downtown Spokane, I am deeply troubled by the proposed ordinance 
C36485, which seeks to eliminate existing restrictions on access and other requirements outlined in the SMC 1039.040 for special events where alcohol is served. The current restrictions include limitations on number of areas serving alcohol and fencing requirements and wristbands are in place for a good reason. They serve to mitigate the risks associated with alcohol consumptions, particularly in areas where large crowds gather, such as events like pig out in the park. But instead of reading the rest of this, I would just like to say, how about we make downtown family friendly? When I walk out my apartment and I have people doing fentanyl, on the sidewalk, you guys seem like you're more focused, an educator, someone that should be more focused on the youth. But instead, we got people on the street. I don't know their exact ages, but you should be focused on that. But instead, we're sitting here talking about making events family friendly. I don't want my daughter around drunks and alcoholics just because you do. Go anywhere else. I mean, I don't know why you, keep, you guys keep on trying to create these crazy ordinances. It's pretty pathetic. And as much as I come up here, I hope you, you, you address my concerns. I don't come up here to speak for the fun of it. It's pretty sad. I come up here, you do no follow-up. I don't even understand what's going on. None of you. And I'm the one that freaking gets you guys voted in. But anyway, thank you. Thank you, Will. Next is Morgan, and then Justice, and then Anton. Morgan, are you online? Okay, I'll come back to you. All right. Uh, is Justice still in the building? You need a minute as well? Okay. Anton, are you ready? Welcome. My name is Anton from Spokane. Um, it's, it's like there are other, there are probably more things other things that you guys can, should be doing rather than worrying about alcohol. And you know what alcohol causes. And we, there are a lot of places where the families can go. And you're wasting your time and wasting everybody's time when there are, like, like uh, the guy before me just said, that there's a lot of drug addicts uh, sitting around the uh, counseling center, you know, where they're supposed to be rehabilitated. And doing drugs and nothing is happening to them. Why don't you think about something, how to uh, work that out? Rather than open it, uh, doing a festival, you know, to have beer. I just want to say, don't pass it, you know, but I know you guys could probably do it anyway. The people on the right get the flag and the people on the left get the flag, but you guys don't care. That's what it looks like. There are justice centers in this town Three of them. Where are the God, where are the where are the lawyers? That's who they should be dealing with. I just want to. That's it. Thank you, Anton. Are you ready, Morgan? No. Justice, are you ready? Well, I got. <laughs> I don't know what else to at this point. The opportunity to. Come, we are not going to. Thank you. Thank you. I am Morgan Greisinger and I reside in Spokane County. I am speaking today regarding proposed amendment C364585, what we're speaking about regarding 
alcohol and minors in public places. When I was 17 or 18 years old, I was hanging out with a biological sister of mine, six years older than me, over age 21, and my biological mom was attending a work party or gathering among coworkers at a local restaurant. The sister decided she wanted to attend and wanted me to also. I entered the restaurant and was told my mom was in a room, which was sectioned off to be primarily where alcohol was served, and any person under the age of 21 was not legally permitted to enter. I do not have full recollection of what was said after this, Witnessing or experiencing a traumatic event can temporarily affect memory. But I remember I was uncomfortable and said to my sister, I didn't know if I should go in there, didn't want to, or didn't know if I wanted to go in there. My sister took me in the room and I approached my mom and said, I didn't know if I should be in the room, who said something to the effect of, it's okay, they won't care. I didn't drink alcohol in the building, in the restaurant, or a restricted area, and only stayed a short time before leaving with my sister. This was approximately 16 to 17 years ago, and within the past year only, I understand any employee or employees, my specified biological sister and biological mom were negligent and failed in their responsibility to protect me while I was a minor. In Washington State, stated in RCW 66.44.310, allowing a minor to frequent a restricted area is a misdemeanor, and police and or, I don't recall, um, I spoke to someone, so I don't recall if police or, or either um, the Washington State Liquor Control Board can issue any person violating, violating this law a criminal citation. Um, I understand there are emergencies where someone might, for safety reasons, need to enter a restricted area. Um, I fully believe an adult taking a minor into a business requiring all persons to be age 21 or over, or any businesses or public or private events restricted area is negligent, and any employee allowing such has committed a crime. Um, responsible drinking is not taking a minor into a space specifically, primarily serving alcohol. Do not put money over people's lives. Protect any person. Do not approve the proposed <laughs> amendment, C36485. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Justice For All, a City of Spokane resident. Um, Y'all have spent as much time on this as you have the rules, which is also very disappointing. Again, there are better things we need to be working on, as everyone has spoken about. And you just passed the rules that are still very unclear, according to the rules that I have read over and over. I believe several people in this council chambers are violating those rules, but I guess rules don't matter because we make them to be as arbitrary as possible. Thank you. Council commentary? Council members phone. Yeah, I'll start. Um, thank you for everyone coming and testifying and sharing stories. Um, I'm um, excited to be finally voting on the family friendly ordinance today. It has been a long journey, uh, but I think it's with good reason and good cause. This was something that we uh, had lots of conversations with different entities, and I think it's a, a better ordinance than it was originally. And so I thank everyone who um, came out and helped share ideas and helped work on this. Primarily, I think there's been a misconception that this is about allowing minors into beer gardens as they exist today, which is a small closed off area that serves and only primarily focuses on serving alcohol. This is about, we changed the language around this, so I think that helps clarify it. It's about just an alcohol service area that is there. So think of a whole festival that you can just walk around the festival. It's not focused on alcohol, they have dancing and music and shops and restaurant food trucks and stuff like that. So there's a lot more going on than just one little section that has a beer garden. That's what this uh, ordinance allows. And you can also think of it as Brick West. At Brick West, there's a fenced in area that people bring their kids, it's in the grass, kids are playing in the corners, their parents are hanging out and chatting. So this is um, not about focusing on that aspect, but it's about creating an environment where uh, families can all go together and spend time together. Uh, this ordinance also aligns with state LCB requirements. Uh, before, Spokane was more restrictive than other cities across our state. And so that is a disadvantage to our nonprofit organizations. This can only be put on with a special occasion ordinance at a nonprofit by a nonprofit. And so they have 
to apply for a, per a permit through the LCB and follow all the regulations of the LCB. And in addition to Spokane, this requires age identification uh, that's non transferable, a wristband or a stamp or something else. And it also requires that the trainers get, uh, or the servers get a training too. And so there, we have a couple other things that we think are safeguards in this uh, ordinance. But overall, I think it's uh, an, an exciting moment. It, there's also a misconception that this means that kids are allowed everywhere, and that's also not true. Uh, event organizers get to decide what type of event they want to have. So this ordinance is just about aligning to the state restrictions and giving event organizers options of the type of event that they want to have and uh, what they want to do in the future. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, I'll be quick. Um, so I, I won't quite get there to support this tonight, but the, the libertarian side of my brain really wants to because I do think that there's, uh, you know, limited government is really important. Um, but in this instance, you know, I think that there's, uh, the, the primary concern that I have is frankly, if issues arise, it's our police department that has to address them and they are under-resourced at this point in time. And to put more on their plate, I just don't think makes a lot of sense. They've had some concerns about this uh, going back. And so um, would love to get to a place where they're more comfortable and I think there's probably a way to do that, but it just doesn't um, seem like we're there yet. And so I just don't want to put more on their plate when they're so challenged. So I'll leave it there. Councilmember Dillon. Yeah, um, thank you. I think Councilmember Zappone uh, did an excellent summary of um, kind of what's this, what's in the ordinance and some of the um, things that were added. This has been deferred a few times, but it was really important to get right. And um, you know, we had a kind of spirited debate about uh, wristbands, and that was uh, some of the concerns that did come from SPD. And I was happy to see that that was uh, added. Uh, back in here, and you know, I do think um, there's just a lot of, a lot of misinformation uh, about this ordinance, and it will um, ultimately really help a lot of our uh, small businesses, a lot of our uh, nonprofits events. We think about downtown, like uh, tacos and tequila um, with HPVA, um, Sp uh, Spanish Business Professional Association, and um, uh, we think about again, downtown or neighborhoods and a lot of uh, economic recovery, this is adding another available uh, tool uh, to them. Um, Morgan, thank you so much for coming down here and, and, and sharing. It's not easy to speak uh, up here and um, definitely keep your, your comments in mind. I'm always very um, concerned around the proliferation of alcohol and, and accessibility and, um, you know, it's, I remember working on the uh, movie theater legislation that allowed some small uh, theaters that we saw, you know, the Garland and Magic Lantern um, also um, use and have um, a, an alcohol license. And um, there's a lot of uh, regulation that comes along uh, with that to make sure uh, that, uh, to try and help prevent minors from uh, accessing uh, alcohol. So. Um, I really appreciate a lot of the diligence that went into this ordinance. Right. You have the council commentary? Council Member Bingo. Uh, yeah, so I ran a couple of amendments on this that ended up getting adopted, and I was glad that they did, and I want to thank uh, Council Members Dylan Zappone for, uh, for listening to those. Um, I worked in a restaurant for, you know, seven and a half years. Our business still is, is heavily involved um, in restaurants. And uh, I can see how it's, it, it is successful when you separate, um, you know, a space where alcohol can be in here and children are here as well. And then its own separate space for a bar area that's just intended uh, for adults. I can also see how uh, spaces like Brick West and others, we've seen other great events uh, here in town where, um, you know, you were able to be there with parents and children and alcohol um, was there. I think that the two amendments we ran uh, largely addressed those issues. So one of the things I know as a bartender, former bartender, um, is that, uh, you know, you are personally liable uh, for both over service and service to minors. Okay. You can, you can actually go to jail if you serve alcohol to somebody who ends up getting drunk driving home. They 
uh, hit somebody with their car and kill them, you can actually also go to jail for that, okay? Those are called dram shop laws. So I thought it was important that people who were uh, serving alcohol would, uh, should understand their personal responsibility and liability, and so that amendment was adopted. There's training that you have to go through, or you can be mass certified. Either way, you're going to know about your responsibility. The second one was wristbands um, or some other non-transferable, clearly identifiable um, something to say, okay, this person has been verified, uh, they are of age, they should be drinking, or you can see somebody who does not have that identification. If they have an alcoholic drink, then you can address that in that moment. With those two things being uh, addressed by this, I think that I'm supportive of this tonight because I think it does open up uh, some options for some events here in town. And I think that it's going to be something that we start to see some, some uh, special events coming to town that wouldn't have happened if not for uh, this ordinance and uh, lining some things up with, with state code. This is not the Wild West. This is not a free-for-all. This is not eight-year-olds are going to be having beers in their hands. That's just not going to happen, right? Because the person who is there serving the alcohol is personally liable and responsible for that. And they will be watching for it in the same way where I, as a bartender, watched that and really cared about that because I understood that I'm personally liable and I made sure that that didn't happen when I was serving. I want to address a couple other things that were said um, on these things being deferred and that's a waste of time. I just disagree. Things that happened here, and I want to commend Council Members Zappone and the others who did this because as we heard tonight, when concerns come up that are things that are important, let's take some time, let's talk through that, and let's find out if we can find a resolution to that. And I think that's what these two gentlemen did. And I want to commend them for that because when those things come up, we as council members should be listening. And I think they did listen. And I think they heard what it was. And, uh, and so I think that that's, that's commendable behavior, that we didn't rush into something because one of the things that was frustrating for many of us last year was that it was just every week there was an emergency ordinance that was just getting pumped out and we actually didn't know what was happening. Now what's happening is good, healthy debate on these issues. And I think Spokane is better for that. And I think that's actually a testament to this council that we do listen, that we do try to come up with things when good, reasonable arguments are put forward that we sit and we listen and, and we make that happen. And I think that we should commend these gentlemen for this. Even if you disagree with the ordinance, I think it's commendable behavior that they heard the concerns of some people and they address some of those things. I also want to talk about one of the other things that was, that was said, that we should be focused on other things. And I totally agree. There are much larger issues in Spokane than this right here, which is why... Uh, you know, I am uh, one of the architects of the Regional Homeless Authority. I, you know, we passed the, the Parks After Dark ordinance last, last year. We passed the drug laws when the state failed after the Blake decision. We passed the drug laws. We, we can focus on multiple things at once. It's not an either or. It's not one thing gets all of our attention. We can do multiple things at once. And so there are massive issues in the city of Spokane. We are totally aware of that. In some ways, our hands are tied in a lot of things, and we have to get really creative, and that takes a little bit more time. Things like this are a way that we can provide a nice system for our businesses, not only downtown, but across the city, nonprofits, not only downtown, but across the city, that have the, the um, ability to put on some really nice, family-friendly festivals. Is that how we got the name? Yep. I, 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 uh, I'm going to be supporting this tonight, and again, I think that um, the, those who worked on this should be commended for their ability to listen uh, to the community. Great. Thank you. I just want to comment, most of these are nonprofits. And nonprofits have not, they're trying to raise money, they have their reputation, they're doing good in the community, and I don't believe a nonprofit will be jeopardizing their 501c3 by selling alcohol to young people or putting them at a disadvantage. I also want to comment, there's a lot going on at council, and we are doing more than one thing at one time. We always have the advanced agenda, and there's a lot percolating in the pot that has to go through a process before you see it, but if you think your council members are not working on your behalf, I want to truly dissuade you right now. That is not true. Prepare to vote. Thank you. Ms. Fister. Ordinance C-36-497 concerning the definition of public parking lot in Title 17, adding a new Chapter 17C.415 to the Spokane Municipal Code Interim Zoning Ordinance. Right. We have Derek speaking, we have Tavita, and then we have Justice. Derek Azaro, District 1. 
again, I'm looking over this. Um, the center and quarter issue is a pretty big issue in the city right now. They're redoing it. They're revamping it. They're trying to make it right. There's a lot of holes in it. Um, this should never been an emergency ordinance. There's no emergency about it whatsoever. In fact, this interim uh, zoning is not necessary. I mean, this, to me, it's starting to look like the D uh, Dylan Sapone, Chick-fil-A, sidestep, line dance again, trying to cut off uh, the public even commenting on this. This is something that needs to be basically brought up here by the, the uh, Planning Commission to be sitting up here with all of you and talk all this out about this uh, center and corridor. You got landlords now using that to uh, build, tear down houses and build apartments. One just happened down in uh, the Logan neighborhood, down by the university. He got the zone, he got the uh, overlay done so he could do that. So there's a lot of factors involved around the center and corridor. You know, I ended up in my neighborhood with a giant dirt pile in my neighborhood from the water department. And they got that because of an emergency ordinance zone overlay center and corridor done by the previous council president. Spent three years trying to fight that, finally got through it. Um, and it's still not done because there's pieces that should have been done that weren't done. So tampering with right now, interims and everything else going on, this is not, this is not the way to do it. And that's why I'm going to speak out against it and put the brakes on it. This is a huge, huge subject. It has major impacts on neighborhoods and anything surrounding these uh, center and corridors. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, issues on here. We're supposed to have public meetings and hearings and, you know, just over this right here. But by trying to slip it through with an emergency ordinance, when the public didn't have any real information on it, I happened to look it up. And I got the wording on it. And like I said, this is not even necessary. It's in play with the Planning Commission. It has to go through a whole rewrite. And by coming up with saying that you're going to have to do this, it has to not only do with that, it has to do with how parking lots are used by commercial property. So are we going to say we're going to tamper this now and say, okay, no more, no more future... Uh, drive-throughs or anything. I happen to know I got another ordinance. I went through that, and I found out that there's a whole line of things with the uh, drive-through ordinances. There's a whole criteria to it. It isn't, they just don't get it without, just by asking for it. There's all kinds of, of really stiff, you know, rules to that. So my only comment is this, right, this should just be, again, like I said earlier, taken off. It's not necessary. It shouldn't be done. Let this go through the entire planning commission, public review, public notifications, all these items, okay? I go, I go to all kinds of meetings all the time, and I can tell you that I see all Thank kinds of things going on, planning commission meetings, and neighborhood Thank meetings. You, Derek. So that's my comment. Thank you. Go ahead, Tavita. Uh, I will not be speaking. I didn't, didn't right. think to say anything. Thank you. Justice? Hello, my name is Justice For All. I do agree with the last speaker on the timing of this ordinance. Last week, this was pushed as the first reading ordinance without any public comment. Again, if we do this on ordinances we agree with, regardless, you know, they're going to do it on ordinances we disagree with. Let's make sure we have process, make sure we're following the rules that are there for a reason. Uh, council should have had public comment for the first reading for this ordinance. It should not be the final reading of this ordinance. Um, but we also saw council also limit the free speech of four individuals uh, and only allow them to say yes or no on the ballot thing as well, uh, which is also very wild. Please, I know, I believe it's Chris Wright's job to be your policy advisor, but please look in and making sure you're using your, rule, your own rules, um, including enforcing the rules that you just passed. You didn't say that they're gonna be delayed for a week. You did pass those rules. Are you not going to point or order the people in this chamber? According to the rules I read, I do not understand how, you know, we're drawing the lines here because it needs to be very clear as I requested before you pass those rules. And now the rules are not clear. And when the line is going to be drawn or whoever is going to be taken out of this chambers, it will be arbitrary because you're not enforcing the rules now. Thank you. Thank you. Point of clarification. I, I believe the, 
last two times we've passed our rules, I've asked for interpretation as to when they take effect, and both times I've been told at the next meeting, so just so people are aware. Any commentary? Yep. Councilman Rodillo. Yeah, got a couple things here uh, to address. I don't know what a Chick-fil-A line dance is. I don't know if I want to see one. Um, but, uh, oh, do you know? Sorry. Uh, <laughs> but on, uh, for this ordinance, you know, it is going to go before the Planning Commission. Um, the emergency clause was removed uh, at the last meeting. We've had a bigger conversation about uh, what uh, constitutes an emergency and what doesn't. And um, I, I think that it was the right thing uh, to uh, delay this. Uh, but part of the reasoning... Um, behind this ordinance is again, and I've mentioned this um, in a previous ordinance about our 40% uh, increase that we've had uh, in pedestrian collisions. Um, this really is necessary for pedestrian access. Um, our centers and corridors and how we address them are uh, inextricably linked to pedestrian uh, safety. And this ordinance, uh, it is uh, an interim zoning ordinance. Um, at the beginning of last month, we had an administrative zoning determination um, that defines what is a public uh, parking lot. And so um, over the next, I think it's six months, uh, the planning commission and, and department um, are going to convene. Um, and permanently adopt uh, the definition that is in this uh, interim ordinance. This was uh, a gap in our code. And again, to address the concerns around the emergency clause, uh, that did get removed. Great. Councilmember Klitsky. So along the same lines as what or Councilmember Dillon is saying, um, it, we did take out, sorry, maybe someday. <laughs> um, we did take Point out the order, emergency. No Council President. Thank you. The emergency section of this ordinance. So it's not an emergency anymore. It's not being run as an emergency. But the reason it exists right now is because, yes, our centers and corridors zoning was kind of inconsistent, confusing, um, not quite right. So our planning director was having to make administrative determinations on the definition of what a public parking lot was because there was no definition in the code. And it's within his rights to do so, but since we are having an uptake in development right now, it's better to get this codified, even though we are working on updating our centers and corridors legislation. And as Council Member Dillon said, um, limiting curb cuts in congested areas is really essential to pedestrian safety. That's why you'll see us trying to limit those things, and that's what these ordinances did. Thank you. Any other council commentary? Prepare to vote. <coughs> Thank you. We'll take a quick five minute recess and then we'll have open forum. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone. We will now proceed with open forum. First up is Dennis Flynn, Sam Lee, and then Dan Du Bois. Hey, Council, thank you. Just some things that came to my mind when we were talking about Expo, just instead of Expo 50, Expo plus 50, make a, uh, there's a lot of people here who have been here. I, I remember Expo and all the balloons. I was only like five or six or whatever, but uh, there's memorabilia that I have in my shoebox in the closet, right? We should have like a locals memorabilia exhibit that people could donate to and maybe a, an online, you know, post your pictures that you've digitized since then. So um, Before you start, Dennis, I'll tell you, Q6 is actually soliciting people's memories for Expo, so nice. that's, please contribute. That's great. And we'll start. I recently attended a land use town hall, and this was the first town hall I've attended, so when we were talking about town halls tonight, um, there are several dozen people that attended this one-hour meeting, which necessarily meant it would be hard-pressed for time. And so, to be honest, there was ample opportunity to improve the way it was run. Uh, so I would propose these seven points for all of you who will be hosting town halls as suggestions to help your citizens feel you value their time and effort to attend. Uh, physical setup, have the room ready before the start time of the meeting, and if not, immediately uh, then inform the meeting the end time will be adjusted to accommodate the actual start time. Uh, agenda, have a clear agenda and follow it. Uh, maybe that's not the case for an open town hall, but for a land use town hall, it would have been nice. Uh, and make it more productive. Um, an introduction. The introduction from the, ca the staff person should take no, no more than one, two, maybe three minutes and to then identify these topics. The purpose of the meeting, one to two examples of topics to include uh, and inform how you will politely interject to get back on track when a non-related topic is broached. Um, and then introduce the council members leading the town hall and then the council members introduction. We're here to talk about the topic, not you, so please keep your introduction brief. Uh, prepared talking points. Uh, talk about what you want to talk about as council members first and then go to the open forum and, and then judiciously and quickly use that interjection previously identified when things get off topic and then have a thank you and close. And my whole point of bringing this up is just to help you have more effective civic engagement. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Sam Lee? On March 10th, Israel is planning a ground invasion of Rafah, and Spokane City Council has still not passed a ceasefire resolution. Spokane City Council will not even call what is happening a genocide. Why is Paul Dillon the only city council member that is willing to support a ceasefire? Is this not a progressive city council? Is that what you call yourselves? Palestinian people are being murdered for land and its resources, and this has always been Israel's plan. Considering the repression that the people have been experiencing in City Hall, all because we opposed the pro-Israel resolution that Jonathan Mingle put forth, an, inter an, an, an international resolution, mind you, it makes sense that the racist and unconstitutional rule changes are happening. Spokane's motto that everyone belongs here is simply not true. The racism that BIPOC people experience here at City Hall and every day outside of this building is purposeful and you are all complicit in it. These colonial rule changes are absolutely connected to the genocide that mo most of you will not speak out against. Zapone says that this is a two-way street, but open forum is at the end of the meeting. How can we have a two-way conversation when this is completely inaccessible? And trying to create a safe space where everyone feels safe and can, and can come and speak, again, open forum is at the end. So how are people supposed to feel safe and where we can come and speak? Kitty says that it's hard to get people to come down to open forum and speak, then change it back change open forum to the beginning. And you say that people don't want international issues. Tell me how you discern that. Because we're saying that we want open forum at the beginning. We're saying we want a ceasefire resolution. You're telling me that it's a both sides issue. How do you determine who gets listened to and who doesn't? Thank you. Thank you. Dan Du Bois. Um, Dan Du Bois, uh, long time, uh, born and raised in Spokane. So Micah 7 8 says, <clears throat> Do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in the darkness, the Lord will be my light. It is easy to let the unprovoked, heinous attack that took place on October 7th against Israel by Palestine fade into distant memory. 
<clears throat> for emotions over time can cause some to see facts differently. Even for minds to be changed as if we did not have it right to begin with. Let me remind you of the facts. The Palestinian people chose their ruling government, Hamas. The charter of which is to the complete annihilation of the Israeli people, period. At 6.30 in the morning, on, a, on the date of October 7th, a day of Jewish holiday while they were celebrating peace, Palestine rained 2,200 missiles into Israel in 20 minutes, followed by a land invasion where they committed unthinkable and heinous atrocities on the Israeli people. We can argue about how many were killed. We can argue about how many were taken hostage. At this point, the numbers become a distraction. The fact remains, Palestine attacked Israel. Palestine took hostages. Palestine continued to fight and are now losing. So they're playing on the emotions of the world, hoping that we don't recognize or remember how this whole thing started. <clears throat> I pray that Israel continues to fight. I, they continue to fight and, there, and thereby eliminates the threat to be brutally attacked again. I don't see this as revenge. I see it as self-preservation. I'm in full agreement with this council's statement of support issued on October 10th, at the heart of which is, is affirms Israel's right to exist and defend itself against acts of aggression and terrorism. Do not weaken your support with a soft resolution. Thank, Thank you. you Travis, and then Kadim, and then War Bear. Hi, my name is Travis Ray. I'm a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation and a volunteer with SCAR. And this is my fourth attempt to speak at Open Forum, um, in which the last three was silenced by shutdown of meetings and pure disorganization. City Council, it is, not, is it still not obvious to you that there, there is a genocide happening? Are you weighing the number of speakers in this room, or have you done any research? Are you listening? I spoke to a Palestinian. They told me their horror is living in Palestine under occupation. They tell me they are too afraid to join in community protest. They tell me they are afraid that their family will be targeted or blackmailed. Council President, point of order. We've got people moving to specifically yes. stand in front of others. Could we please be, is that the identifier that you Yeah, in the, in the back there. Sir, could we just please ask you to step two steps to the, to the right or left? I'm sorry. I don't see how that's less yeah, disruptive. Yeah, that's still standing in front of people there. Is the person behind him And it's not, it's not that they were sitting there and then stood up. They were sitting in the back. They came up in to specifically stand in front of a couple people. That is disruptive. Is the view of the person standing behind him obstructed? I would say so, yes. Yes. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Point of, out of order. Yes. Sir, could you really, there's a whole chamber of places to stand and to speak, which we want to hear what you have to say. Uh, I'm just going to ask, just please move just to, there you go, just a little bit down so they can see. Thank you so Thank much. You. Appreciate that. Continue. So, yeah, you can film here, can, too, but the action is clearly that. there yeah. to intimidate. Yeah. This is a problem. We're trying yeah. to do what's in the rules, We're, but there are a couple people who are specifically trying to cause problems. This is not acceptable behavior here. Thank, thank you. Please, please order no outbursts in the chambers. Thank you. Travis, are you ready to continue? Right, please. Everybody else? Thank you. <laughs> We were talking about standing, and I'm talking about genocide. Like, what are we doing? <sighs> this Palestinian that I spoke to, they told me they're too afraid to come down here and tell you themselves. When you have a council who puts forth a resolution drowning in racism, Islamophobia, and hatred of Palestinians, and continues to put these restrictive rules in place, I think fear is a justified response. We talk about intimidation. My Palestinian friends are too afraid to speak for their people. 
people of color have something to say or simply want to stand up and you label that as intimidation, you are intimidating the public, you are restricting our rights, you are upholding this oppressive and institutionally racist environment. I just want to remind you that 13,000 children are dead. Over 100,000 Palestinian casualties. Do you hear me? It's been over 150 days. This whole genocide just slipped your mind. You want to prove that you're listening. You want to prove that you're for the people. Start by calling for a ceasefire. Thank you. Kadeem, and then Warbear. Hello, my name is Kadeen, and I'm a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation. I wanted again today to speak on the second ceasefire resolution that this council passed. Much like the first one, it was completely inadequate, failed to use the active language surrounding genocide, and really acknowledge the 30,000 plus Palestinian people murdered by the hands of the Israeli government. We've seen 40 cities across this country do the same thing that the city council could do right here which is call for an actual ceasefire resolution and push our government to stop funding Israel. Now, I want to speak a little bit about intimidation since that seems to be such the big topic here. We can call it intimidating for a brown man to stand up in a public meeting, but it wouldn't be considered intimidating for anybody to stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance. To you, a brown man standing up is intimidating because his mere existence challenges white supremacy. To me, while everyone's standing up in this chamber saluting a fascist flag, talking about right before then a land acknowledgement where we say that the city is dedicated to serving its indigenous residents, while in the next second afterwards everyone stands up and salutes the flag of the same country that genocided us, that continues to murder us to this day, that pushed us onto reservations. Are you fucking kidding me? We can, you're talking about intimidation. That is intimidating. The power behind that flag is intimidating. Everyone in this room standing up to salute genocide, to salute white supremacy, to salute capitalism, to, su to salute exploitation, that's intimidating. If we really want to talk about intimidation, again, we must talk about the power. The power does not belong in the hands of us. We don't have any. You have the ones. You have the power to enforce state violence, to bring police in here if it gets too rowdy. We don't. Again, the power is in your hands. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Warbear and then Mickey Pike Hatfield. <coughs> oh, and Honey Lichin, Masiapi, Okichize, Mato, we used to be in the house, we used to be in the house, we used to be in the house, I do it all. I do know a wamu. I truly do so see wamu. And I see all so wamu. I saw many humans on whom there were no clothes. I saw many clothes in which there were no humans. This country, this government, and this military has broken over 500 treaties between them and indigenous people. And you want me to follow your rules? You want me to be quiet, to be obedient, to be passive? You move my people through colonization and forced assimilation and mutilation and genocide in boarding schools or residential schools, and you want me to be quiet? You want me to follow your example, the United States example? They don't even follow their own example. Come to a reservation. I invite you all, see what the poverty is like. See what the alcoholism is like. See the effects of colonization. It's a privilege for those people to say, oh, it doesn't affect us. And yet I have to live with the consequences of their reality of colonization. Come to a res, see what it's like. 500 treaties, 500. 
and you want me to follow your rules? This is ridiculous! Thank you. Mickey Pike and then Mike Gleason. Hello, my name is Mickey Pike Hatfield, and I'm from Spokane in the Shadal area. I would like to start off by saying I would love to know what brain-eating disease you have all seemed to have been infected with to bring about such ill-conceived rules and regulations. <sighs> Standing blocks the view? What are the TVs for? They can clearly just turn their heads a little to the right, a little to the left, to see what is going on. Are we putting our hands over their ears so they can't hear what people are saying? No, they can clearly hear what is going on. And if they need to see, there are options everywhere. So this standing rule does not help anyone but silencing people like me. If you want to represent anyone other than the wealthiest members of the community at the expense of the masses, you will, every week, host open forum at the beginning of the meeting with 20 randomized slots. Council President. You will allow standing recording Sir, and present. We've already voted on that. The rules have been passed. You will allow recording and presentations. Do not restrict the topics Point that order. people can speak on We've at already the open forum. We've dealt with this. We, we have. You can record. There's TVW. You can access it online. Uh, it's Restricting topics? We have already voted on this, so this is open forum. Okay. So there was an opportunity to speak on this when it was up for the legislative vote. Can I just make one point on it at least? Do emails that get sent to you get read in front of the attendance, attendees here today? There's a point to speaking on these topics at a forum like this. It is to let everyone who is here know and people who see this online. Do those emails get uploaded to YouTube? No. We need other people to be able to hear what we are saying and to see what kind of support we get for what we are saying. That is all I have to say. Thank, Thank you. you. Do better. Council President, just a point of clarification. I believe if you do copy Terry Fister on those emails and request that it be included in the public record, it will be in the public record in our packets of information that does go out to the public. Mike Gleason. Council members, I'm going to address uh, 2024 0009. Egypt's top diplomat delivered a blunt assessment last week of the turmoil in the Middle East. Delusional apologists for protesting in the United States and elsewhere in support for Hamas terrorists should pay heed. Speaking in Germany at a, at a security conference on Saturday, Egypt's foreign minister, Samah Shukri, criticized Hamas. The organization is outside the Palestinian consensus, he said, which recognizes Israel and wants to reach negotiations with it only because Hamas is not ready to give up support for violence. He also said his nation, now this is right, right next to him, his nation had no intention of providing safe areas in Egyptian territory for the Palestinians if Israel launches an offensive in Rafah, but we will deal with it with the necessary humanity. Mr. Shukri's comments highlight two points. First, Hamas' stated goal of using its barbaric October 7th attack on Israel to push the Arab world to stand alongside the terror group in an effort to eradicate the Jewish state has failed. Second, the remarks vindicate Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's stance that a negotiated ceasefire with Hamas will only embolden the terror group. Egypt has been involved in negotiations between Israel and Hamas to end the hostilities, but Mr. Shakri is acknowledging acknowledges that Hamas would use any cessation of violence to simply recover, reload, 
before eventually resuming its savage attacks on Israel. Hamas leaders have publicly proclaimed they will plan to carry out more massacres like the one that provoked the current fighting and left 1,200 innocent dead. As Mr. Shakri so adaptly noted, Hamas remains wedded in violence and in the elimination of Israel, read their charter, until the terror group recognizes that its, strategic, uh, its strategy will lead to its ruin and violate civilized norms. And it would help more Arab leaders exhibit Mr. Shakri's political courage. Thank you, Israel has every Thank right you, Mike, to take up. up its arms against those who kill Thank its you. civilians and threatens its very existence. Thank you. P please, no outbursts from the audience. Thank you very much. Dave. Dave Billsland. No problem. Back in the late 80s, I was sitting down with my dad while he was a county commissioner in Grace Harbor County. And he and I were talking about how it is to be in office, as you guys are. And he said, there's two kinds of people in politics. There's mouths and there's ears. Okay, all of us out here, we're a bunch of mouths. We're kind of loud sometimes, a little crazy. Sorry, but that's the way people are. And you folks are the ears. And I feel for you because you've got to listen to every nut that comes down the pike. Every one of us. Well, that's why you need to listen. When we speak to you, it's important. After all, we, <laughs> we helped you get where you're at. Okay? And you need to listen. And what you need to listen to is us first in the city council agenda. We are more important than the legislative agenda because we are the people and we need to be listened to first. Now I spent 15 years with this situation and I didn't like it one bit. And I spent the last five years with it happening before the legislative agenda. And believe me, you had a lot more people talking, a lot more people enthused, because they could get the word out to you ears. So you have something to listen to. That's important. So put us first. Don't make us sit through a whole meeting, especially when you get into budgets. Oh, I avoid those for that reason. But we need the agenda. We need the public forum to happen before the legislative agenda. I know it got disturbed once, and I'm sorry about that. But that is an anomaly. That's not normal. Okay? Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bring it back to first. Just a reminder that was voted on tonight. Um, next up is Earl Moore and then <coughs> Eugene Knowles. Good evening, Council President Wilson and all of the Council. Did any of you notice it snowed last night and the temperature dropped down in the 20s? While we're all warm and cozy right now inside of this chamber, I'd like to remind you that the temperatures are going to drop again to 20 degrees. Can anyone explain to me why the city closed <clears throat> required warning center beds last week? Our winter weather is far from over. Mayor Brown reduced 100 beds at track and closed the cannon shelter on Friday. Where is the outrage today? The former administration would never have gotten away with anything like that for the homeless in the middle of the winter. They would be, the media would be all over this and people would be protesting. I'd like to remind you this decision is a violation of two city council ordinances that I researched. Spokane Municipal Code Section 18.05.020 directs the city to open inclement weather centers beyond existing homeless shelter capacity for each day the National Weather Service predicts temperatures of 30 degrees or lower. The city has violated this ordinance for the past three days and tonight will make it the fourth. Spokane Municipal Code Section 1805 
1.030 says, at no time shall the, city re shall the city reduce or eliminate night by night shelter beds unless authorized by the city council. Did you pass a resolution to close the Cannon shelter last week? Did you pass a resolution to close Cannon last year uh, uh, at the direction of former council Biggs? Why do you care less about our homeless freezing on the streets under Mayor Brown's administration, and why do you pass ordinances that you aren't requiring new administrations to follow? Thank you, Earl. I will share a point of information. Beds were expanded at the church shelter outreach, so there was no decrease in overnight beds. Eugene. Good evening, uh, Eugene Knowles, uh, been here in Spokane uh, since 2010. Um, got a couple numbers here, roughly 200,000 people here in Spokane, and 10% of those people would be 20,000. Um, 2,000 would be 1%. That's about how many people are homeless. We're just talking about the homeless. Uh, that's about how many law enforcement people here, including the police, uh, military, etc. 1% is uh, 200 people. That's about how many people can fit in here. Uh, 20 people, about how many people come up here to speak every night, uh, plus or minus, is 10% uh, of the 1%, which is a hundredth of 1%. That's how many? So 99.999% of the people don't speak here on a given night. So we don't know what they're thinking or what they're saying. Doesn't matter what they're thinking or saying because they're not here. Here's the point. Sometimes the venue matters as much or more than the people. So, well, the people, they're important. Of course they're important. I said, sometimes. If you're in jail, jail matters more than who's in there because you're in jail. You can talk about your rights and what, but you're in jail. If you're standing in front of a judge or you're standing in front of a Supreme Court justice, uh, your personal rights are going to be very limited because the bailiff is standing there. You, you can't say a thing. Here's the problem that we're facing here. And we had it before when a pastor brought about 20 or 30 people in here. They all wanted to read from the Bible. Extremism on the and right. Thank you, Eugene. I'll see you next Monday night. I'll finish it next time. Thank you. Zach McGuckin and then Raul Pinna. Um, uh, so before I get into what I was planning on speaking on, um, I want to say that that's, uh, maybe it's a misperception, but that's wild that you all didn't have an agenda or weren't set up on time for the town hall. How are you expecting your citizens to want to interface with you, to want to remain civically engaged if, uh, you're still setting up when this town hall is supposed to start? Um, but maybe I misunderstood that testimony, uh, that's definitely possible. Um, I want to uh, once again come to this council and say that we need a ceasefire resolution. We are uh, six days away from the Israeli military's ground invasion of Rafah, or their projected date, um, and uh, this will be a devastating catastrophe for all of humanity where some of the most vulnerable people in the world are about to be massacred and this is not a far off thing these are our families our friends um, the people of Spokane's friends and uh, apparently this council refuses to call for uh, them to not be slaughtered um, additionally I want to talk about you know when um, White, white people in here are laughing or making comments in between speakers, it's silent. Um, yet when brown people are standing, when brown people are recording, they're called intimidating. Uh, we heard people say, uh, you know, uh, Palestine attacked first. 
does the uh, slave master who's o- or the slave who overthrows the slave master is he the one who is attacking first? Are the people here resisting these oppressive rule changes? We're not just doing that for no reason. It's because you all keep narrowing and narrowing and tightening your grasp. And so bring open form back to the beginning of the meeting and call for a ceasefire. Thank you. I'm going to take a point of privilege. Justice, what were you trying to indicate to me by... Thank you for pointing out. Honestly, not to disparage the rules, we did not, I did not observe that, so my apologies for that. So when you do this, I have no idea what that's about. But all right, thank, thank you, Justice. Thank you. Raul? My name is Raul Pena, District 1. Thank you, gentlemen, for supporting my neighborhood. I came up here to talk about um, school safety for kids. But for two and a half hours, all I've heard is how people are, want to stand up and, and turn their backs. But yet, at the beginning of each meeting, none of them stand up to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Point, none point of them. Council President, this is about the rules. Yeah. We, yeah. Thank you. Um, Rob, well, they've anyway. been voted on. Yeah. Is there any other comments you'd like to make? As basically, we all listen. We all hear. We're tired. We want to go home. City Council Open Forum is to talk about city issues, not overseas. We need to focus on what we need to do to better the city of Spokane by entrusting the rules and regulations, by making sure that our kids can go to school, walk safely, without being run over by cars. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sunshine? And then we'll have Tavita after that. Hi. Sunshine from Spokane, Washington. Um, So this is my friend Katie behind me who does the um, morning meetings at the R Club with Frank. Um, On average, there is 18 meetings a week between NA and AA. As we get older, we lose interest in our routines and enjoyed activities. Not only can we revive the club fellowship also revived Frank's 12-step in helping other alcoholics. Um, If we were to make a holiday for him in honor of him, he who wishes to secure the good of others has already secured his own. Caring has the gift of making the ordinary special. You must be the change you wish to see in the world. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. I come here today in honor of Frank Howe at the Art Club. I want to say thank you for the $45,000 you gave this club in emergency funding to keep the doors open last year. Frank just had five major surgeries back to back and is currently 80 years old. He started in 1977, I think it was. Um, We have made you a banner to show you how much we love Frank and how much this club is asking for this. We would use this holiday after he passes away because he's getting older. We don't get to last forever, darn it. We would be using this for a fundraising day when Sandy takes over the club because the club will go on even after Frank. So if we were to make a holiday in honor of him, that's what we would be using it for. And I was asked to come here and ask you guys for that. And I think I've put pretty much my whole spill there. This is a gift for you guys and the declarations from the people there. Thank you. Sunshine, if you leave those on the desk, Tavita? 
And then Janelle. Hi, council members, uh, council member Bits Bukasin. Um, uh, my name is Tavita Fakasieki. I'm from Spokane. Uh, many of many of you know who I am. I find it quite difficult to see that I supported y'all in supporting an ordinance which makes a committee to check on statues and monuments like the John R. Monahan statue, which we may take down. I am not angered. I am disappointed and also frustrated at how hypocritical this is to be in solidarity with the Samoan people here in Spokane, but not be in solidarity with those, with both the inter, with all the interfaith community, including Palestinians who are in Spokane as well. Now, first, why do we need a ceasefire? Many cities in the United States have made ceasefire resolutions to be in solidarity with all Jewish, Christian, and Muslim populations in Palestine. This war does not signify anything other than the brutalization, adultification, and genocide of millions of Christians, Muslims, and, and Jewish populations who have suffered under the oppression and repression of the state of Israel. There are a lot of continuous sayings of if, if Israel is a Jewish state or a regulated nation. The people who say Israel is placed unto the lands by God think Israel as a theocratic state meaning that Israel is a Jewish state. Others think that Isra Israelis are God's chosen people and believe that they are the only civilized nation in the Middle East, which isn't at all truthful. This gives me a sense of those using God and religion again as a way to force hateful, abusive, hateful and abusive words and acts on indigenous, on indigenous or on this land to be killed or this place, just like the indigenous peoples here on Turtle Island Thank and you. across the Thank world. Thank you, Tabita. Your time is up. Thank you, Janelle. And then Tanya. Hi, I'm Janelle, and I'm a citizen of Spokane. Um, I'm deeply dismayed by the actions of Spokane City Council in creating a noise ordinance seemingly aimed at silencing pro-life supporters outside Planned Parenthood, Spokane, in March of 2020. The church at Planned Parenthood, consisting of individuals praying and holding religious services outside this abortion clinic, has been unfairly targeted by this ordinance. It's disheartening to witness the Spokane City Council bowing to the complaints of Planned Parenthood, its staffers, alleged that prayers and songs outside the clinic disrupt their operation. This ordinance appears to be a direct attack on the freedom of speech and religious expression of pro-life advocates, including Pastor Ken Peters and others who gather to peacefully protest. The CEO of Planned Parenthood of Greater Washington, Northern Idaho statement characterizing pro-life supporters as bully, bullies is deeply troubling. These individuals are exercising their First Amendment rights to advocate for the sanctity of life and offer support to women facing difficult decisions. To label them as bullies is not only inaccurate, but also unjust. Former Spokane City Councilwoman Lori Kinnear introduced this ordinance, further exasperating the injustice, strengthening a state law to target peaceful demonstrations is a clear abuse of power and undermines the principles of democracy and free speech. Furthermore, the revelation that current City Councilman Paul Dillon, then Vice President of Public Affairs for Planned Parenthood, had extensive communication with the City Council, including celebrating after Planned Parenthood sued Pastor Peters and others, is deeply concerning. It raises questions about the impartiality and integrity of the City Council's decision-making process excuse me, process. As a concerned citizen, I urge the Spokane City Council to reconsider you, its Your stance. Time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just make a yeah. quick comment? Sure. Yeah, just really briefly. Um, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I remember when this ordinance passed, it was four years ago, and I was a, a former employee, but uh, it was never enforced. So that's all I got to say. Thank you. Tanya? <laughs> Hey everyone, um, I I think that um, Avista is not um, treating the um, residents here fairly, you know, because they're they're 
um, when they're writing people's bills up, you know, and, and they and people that are disabled, you know, they we want to be keep, get keep warm inside our apartments, you know, and Avista, you know, they keep raising people's bills, you know, so so we can get to keep warm in our apartments, you know, and when we move, you know, they. They should get let us stay on the program that they, that they, we were on before. You know they shouldn't go and um, and see how much the bills are for a year or something. You know they should just put let us stay on the program that we are on. You know because there there's people that don't have enough money. You know, the, for the electric bills, you know, and they they want people, disabled people to be cold, you know, they don't want us to keep warm in in the winter time, you know, and and they raise our our our, our, our the money too for when we use the um the our air conditioners too. You know they should they shouldn't do that to us. Thank you, Tanya, for coming down. Yeah. Catherine Johnson, and then Scott Ward. Mm -hmm. is Scott online. Yeah, it's, <clears throat> Scott is online. But Catherine, are you online? If you're online, can you hit star three? Okay. Scott. Go ahead, Scott. I'm going to start by reading a report from an American doctor who was in Gaza. I stopped keeping track of how many new orphans I had operated on. After surgery, they would be filled uh, somewhere in the hospital. I'm unsure of who will take care of them or how they will survive. On one occasion, a handful of children, all about ages five to eight, were carried to the emergency room by their parents. All had singer. All had single sniper sniper shots to the head. These families were returning to their homes in Khan Yunus, about 2.5 miles away from the hospital, after Israeli tanks had withdrawn. But the snipers apparently stayed behind. None of these children survived. In 2002, Chris Hedges, an American journalist, wrote about the conduct of the Israeli military in Gaza. He said, "Children have been shot in other conflicts I've covered." But I've never, never before watched soldiers entice children like mice into a trap and murder them for sport. I also challenge every single council member to watch the documentary Gaza, Gaza Fights for Freedom, which is free on YouTube. And you can watch as the Israeli military snipes innocent children and medics in the head while laughing and celebrating. The Israeli military says themselves they know exactly where every sniper bullet goes and all, and all tar targets hit are intentional. On March 10, Israel is planning on invading Rafah, the last habitable place in Gaza. Millions of Palestinians have been forced into Rafah, which is now one of the most densely populated places in the world. The U.S. backed Israeli genocide, and it is a genocide, according to countless Holocaust and genocide experts, many of whom are Jewish, has killed more than 30,000 Palestinians in the last five months. This number, experts say, is a massive undercount, as thousands more are still under the rubble. The U.S.-backed Israeli military has murdered an unprecedented number of journalists, children, healthcare workers, U.N. workers, and civilians in comparison to all other modern wars. Israel is intentionally creating famine in Gaza. Their leaders have been clear in this intent, and they continue to block food and aid trucks. We are on the brink of mass death. You, you must pass you, a Scott. ceasefire resolution. An American Thank doctor you, who went... Next up is Justice for All, then Lucas. I want to talk about the rule of changes passed this January. Um, you also restricted uh, people's right to speak on current and advanced agenda items. That was not pr previously, uh, you did remove the section that said this will not interfere with people's ability to speak on current and advanced agenda items. That section was removed. That is, a, again, an issue. Just like the other thing that was passed recently that's saying another restriction on what we're able to talk about at Open Forum. When you are creating restrictions on free speech, you better be sure. I don't want to guess. 
I want certainty that you are sure you are right about these decisions you are making. You prevented four people from speaking at this podium. It was Will Hewlings, Dave M., and a couple of others who came to speak at this podium. And you told them they were only allowed to say whether they are for or against. Um, I'm not sure how to say it, but yeah, you, can, you only allowed them to say that on, I believe it was February 4th. How is there any context for who those people are or why they're for or against something if you didn't allow them to speak? You have violated their ability to speak on that, and that was also wrong. The, what was passed today was wrong, but we're not allowed to talk about it. Makes absolutely no sense. I did want to talk about a maker studio. So a maker studio is what they have in a lot of other cities and what we should install at the STA Plaza. A maker studio is allow, allows young, hopefully young people, a lot of times people complain about our unhoused teens or our teenagers in general being too violent. But how about we give them something to do, some recreation, something they can actually build upon and, and build up their dreams. We need a maker studio in Spokane. I'll, I'll send you a proposal, all city council members. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next is Lucas. Good evening. Ask yourself, what kind of society are we building if we allow ourselves to fund and support genocide? As our elected officials, you have the power to say something, to do something. Instead, you use your power, power borrowed from the people you serve, to give the second most deadly police force per capita more money. You do not adequately support or provide addiction treatment services to shelter our unhoused, your actions lead to the deaths and suffering of our city's residents. Your refusal to take our needs seriously has real negative impacts and consequences, as does your lack of action on Palestine. Week after week, we the people come here to City Hall and beg you to listen, to come to reason, to denounce genocide. And we are met with mockery and derision. Shame on you. You owe it to yourself to oppose genocide. If not for humanity, then for the clarity of your own consciences. I and many others have already told you of the horrors, of the crimes against humanity that Israel commits every single day. Every single day, a new atrocity, worse than the last. I and many, ugh. and every session, you read a land acknowledgement, admitting to our own ongoing colonial history but fail or even refuse to see what is going on in front of your eyes. I invite you to save your conscience, to be a part of the peace process, and pass a ceasefire resolution. I cede the rest of my time to Aaron Bushnell and the people of Palestine. A moment of silence, please. Thank you. Will Hewlings and then Charles. I believe that's, you've hit 20. Oh, we've hit 20. All right, sorry, Will. That's it for tonight. Yeah, we, we already hit 20, I'm, Will. I'm sorry. sorry, Will. That was my, I wasn't kidding. Yeah, okay. Thank you all for attending. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 This meeting is adjourned.